we were talking about the respira uh, respiration, lungs, okay, how we get the air inside the lungs, how we get it out, okay, the respiratory cycle, inspiration, expiration. And we finished at this point when we were, were talking about the control of breathing, the different centers that participate, different structures that participate in regulation and regulating the the respiratory rate or how deep we breathe. Remember when you analyze the respiration, for example, if you are you have a vignette or a question in an exam, okay, try to uh, make sure you understand what is the situation, specific situation. If we are talking about the normal, quiet, tight down respiration, there is only one muscle that is gonna be used and that is the diaphragm during inspiration. Expiration requires no muscle, just relaxing the diaphragm. Okay, so you have all these uh, different groups that participate in controlling those muscles of the respiration. And for example, let's say we are, we give you a case of someone who's sleeping or someone who is just watching TV or doing something, reading a book, okay? Yeah. In that case, we have the, uh, the primogenitor complex or the pattern generator is like the pacemaker that depending on the conditions of the blood is going to determine what is the respiratory rate, the normal respiratory rate. Okay, when we say normal respiratory rate, remember this is something that is different for every person. Okay, a healthy person, young person uh, may have a normal respiratory rate of about 12, 13, 14 per minute. But someone who has COPD, for them, the normal respiratory rate may be higher than that. Okay, because they have more difficulty eliminating CO2, so they need to breathe faster. Okay, so in the case of a quiet tidal inhalation, okay, the primogenitor complex determines what is the respiratory rate, and then we are gonna have the signals going from there, okay, to the dorsal respiratory group, Okay, that is this little backpack here. Okay, that is the one that will send the signals to the diaphragm for contraction. And then the diaphragm relaxes and the chest recoils. Now, if we need to do a more effortful, okay, deeper inspiration and more forceful expiration, then we need to use all the muscles. Okay, for example, the ventral respiratory group is not gonna do anything during the tidal expiration. Just stay there, okay? And it's gonna participate in the more active expiration and inspiration. And then we have the fine tuners, okay? The nuclei that are located in the pons, okay? The upper levels. We have one that is called apneustic, and the other is called pneumotaxic. Remember, apnea means when someone stops breathing. So that is the one that is gonna respond when someone stops breathing for a while. Okay, let's say someone has a sleep apnea, for example, uh, or someone simply decides to stop breathing. Let, let, let's see uh, who has more resistance. Let's stop breathing and count. There's a moment when it doesn't matter how much you try to not breathe, that center is gonna activate respiration. And the contrary is the action of the pneumotaxic center. If you try to inflate your lungs too much, okay, that will protect the lungs against exploding, okay, so it's gonna uh, signal to stop breathing okay, every time there is hyperinflation of the lungs. Okay, so that's more or less the idea, the most important things about this. And we are gonna see how the communication between all these uh, sensory receptors and respiratory uh, nuclei occurs. Okay, it's very important to understand the response to chemo uh, of the chemoreceptors to different chemicals. Okay, we have some central chemoreceptors located in the brain stem, detecting the composition of the cerebrospinal fluid. And we have the peripheral chemoreceptors, okay, located in the aortic body, carotid bodies. There is that there are some differences between them. Okay, for example, the chemoreceptors uh, normally sense the changes in the cerebrospinal fluid hydrogen concentration. So they are 
measuring the pH. Okay, every time we have oxy uh, CO2 retention, that is going to produce a respiratory acidosis. Okay, that uh, will uh, lead to an increase in the hydrogen concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid, and that will make the central chemoreceptors fire signals to the respiratory center, so we uh, have a deeper and a faster respiratory rate. Now. That is something that uh, may happen, and it's important to know for clinical practice. These central chemoreceptors may be desensitized. Okay? When you bother too much the chemoreceptors in the brainstem, and, you, and, and they, they have for too long uh, this exposure to hydrogen ions, they will react to that, and they will start making bicarbonate. Okay. You are giving me acid, I'm going to produce an, a base to neutralize that. Okay, so they may get desensitized, they may not respond to changes in the uh, acidosis of the blood or the cerebrospinal fluid. People who have a chronic hypoxia, for example, uh, people who are exposed or have a long-term retention of carbon dioxide, like uh, someone with COPD or... Uh, Different, or someone who smokes, for example, okay, they may get these uh, central chemoreceptors desensitized. Now, the peripheral ones, they don't desensitize, so they have a lower impact on the respiratory rate uh, compared to the central chemoreceptors. In the aortic body, carotid bodies, we have receptors that will, for example, detect how much oxygen and CO2 is present in the blood, they are not, they don't respond to pH changes in the aortic body. Now the ones in the carotids, okay, they detect oxygen, CO2, and pH changes. And also, they, are, they uh, respond to changes in pressure, okay, but the area that responds to changes in pressure, we call it the baroreceptor, okay, sensing if there is any problem with the, with the pressure. Um, I don't know, sometimes when we study uh, all these things and uh, we have to study many other things, it's difficult for us to, to remember some details. Okay? And we need to, to try to find ways of remembering that forever. Okay? That's something that I, uh, I always do. Okay? Let's say I have to study anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, clinical medicine, behavioral medicine, this and that, and many things. And I get to this point, uh, well, the aortic body responds to CO2 and oxygen, but not to pH, and the carotid to oxygen, CO2, and pH. How do I remember that forever? How, how, how can I make sure that I don't have to come back to this slide to, oh, then let me try to remember which is the... Everybody will have their own method, okay? Maybe someone prefers to write down a hundred times, no? Or to say it out loud 20 times, okay? But for example, we can use the, I always, when I study, I have a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And I say, okay, this is the arctic, the aorta, arctic arc, and then we have here the carotids, okay? And that sends the blood to the brain. So this is like having two checkpoints for the blood that is going to the brain. Okay, I will have a checkpoint here, and I will have a checkpoint here and here. The number two, the two carotids. So, which is closer to the brain? Right. Carotid. So it's the final checkpoint before the blood reaches the brain. So that is a checkpoint that we need to make sure that everything is correct. And I have that idea in my, I imagine someone in the airport, you have the luggage, uh, the checkpoint in the, in the airline, then you have the immigration. So, more or less you say, okay, I, this last checkpoint before the blood enters the brain, these are the people who need to ensure that the blood has the proper oxygen, CO2, and pH. Okay, and that way, so maybe that works for you, maybe that doesn't, but gives you an idea. Okay, once I have that in my mind, that slide is over. I don't have to go back to that slide. Because there are a hundred more. Okay, and then there is 
the anatomy, and then there is the other thing, and the other thing. Okay? Because you can read this five times and then not, not, not remember. Oh, which one the pH is, was the carotid or the artery? Okay? Doesn't matter if you read five, ten times. So here okay, we have more of, a, of the same thing. It's like a graphic representation. And the purpose of this is to show you that, for example, someone has, a, someone is exercising, someone has COPD, someone has CO2 retention. Okay, they are gonna have an elevation of a CO2 okay, in the blood. Okay, remember this equation that we are gonna be mentioning many times, the carbonic anhydrase equation. Okay, the, 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 the increased CO2 in the blood will lead to what we call a respiratory acidosis in the blood. Okay, by the way, the, the correct term is acidemia. Okay, acidemia, when the blood becomes acidic. Okay, when we see a, a blood test, and we see that the pH of the blood is low, we don't say acidosis, we say acidemia. Okay, acidosis is the process, okay, that leads to acidemia in the blood. Okay, that is what we see. So, someone has acidemia, okay, that is characterized by elevation of hydrogen. There is that hydrogen has a plus there. Okay, it's a charged substance. So that hydrogen ion is not gonna enter into the brain. Okay, there is a very tightly controlled blood-brain barrier. Okay, any charged particle is unable to pass through membranes much less through the blood-brain barrier. Okay, now CO2 is able to pass. CO2 is a gas. CO2, oxygen, they pass freely through membranes. Okay, when we have a, a elevated CO2, it will combine with water, will form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen. That hydrogen is the one that will stimulate the respiratory centers Okay, to increase respiration. That is happening at the central level. So for example, this CO2 from the blood okay, may enter, the, uh, may pass through the blood-brain barrier and combine with water there, and then the hydrogen is the one that will stimulate the respiratory center, not the CO2 directly. Okay? That's important because it doesn't matter how elevated the CO2 is even this has been happening for a long time and this person is producing excess demand the, 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 the production of cerebrospinal fluid now we produce a CSF with higher bicarbonate we secrete more bicarbonate okay this elevation of the CO2 that then will dissociate into hydrogen ions that hydrogen is going to be absorbed it's going to be buffered by the bicarbonate that we produce, so that CO2 elevator is not gonna represent anything for the brain stem. Okay? Now, peripherally, okay, we have the aortic bodies, okay, and we have the carotid bodies. Okay? Notice that the carotid body, the one that is closer to the brain, is the one that will respond to hypoxemia, to elevated CO2, and to low pH. So that is the one who even uh, if the central chemoreceptors are desensitized, are going to continue responding to elevated CO2, okay, or to Thank you.
you imagine that you are given the task of creating a multiple choice question that includes anatomy and or physiology, everything together? Okay, and you see there are uh, several receptors that are sensing different things. Oxygen, CO2, pH. Okay, and you have other chemicals. For example, you have water, you have carbonic acid, bicarbonate. Okay, so those could be your options. A, B, C, D, E, F, all the letters. Okay. And you see that the receptors are located in different places, out of the body, out of the body, there are central human receptors that respond to different things. So there is like a matching, no? Central chemoreceptors receptors respond to hydrogen only. Okay? Then you have the aortic receptor that respond to changes in oxygen and CO2. And you have the carotid body receptors that respond to oxygen, CO2, and pH levels. You notice how this matching okay, can help you to create questions. Which of the following will most likely respond to this or that? Okay. For example, if you, we use the central chemoreceptors, there is a one possible option only. That is hydrogen ions or pH changes or acidosis in the cerebrospinal fluid. Because this doesn't detect hydrogen in the blood, but in the CSF. Okay? And we can use anatomy and say the patient has a lesion that destroys the carotid body, the, the, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Mm, now I have fibers that are not reaching the brain. Okay, so the brain is not going to respond to changes in the blood what? pH. At least on that side, no? you have to. Unless you've got the two glossopharyngeal nerves. Okay, but that's the way questions are created. Okay, these ones don't detect hydrogen ions. Only these ones. So the vagus nerve is the one that carries information from the arctic body, while the glossopharyngeal from the carotid body. And this has many applications in the future. Someone is has a tachycardia, you give it a, a, a massage, okay, a carotid body massage. Which nerves carry the information? The glossopharyngeal nerve. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are the things that typically are asked in questions. Remember, I told you at the beginning, make two folders in your brain. One is for medical practice, one is for your future work as a PA, and the other is for preparing for, ex for exams. Okay, how can this be asked? Okay. And, well, here we have more or less the same thing in a different way, okay? Uh, if you prefer one of these uh, diagrams, uh, use one or the other, they contain more or less the same thing. Okay, this, on the left you have the representation of how variations in arterial blood are sensed in the central chemoreceptors, the CO2 is the one that passes. Notice that this hydrogen is not moving through. Same concept. Okay, being detected by the peripheral chemoreceptors and central chemoreceptors. Okay, they will stimulate the brainstem control centers, respiratory centers, to increase ventilation. Okay, and here we have exactly the same. Is the CO2 moving? Okay, into the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, you're not. There is the hydrogen being stuck there by these tight junctions between the cells. Okay, <coughs> blood-brain barrier. And the CO2 combining with water, forming carbonic acid, and this being detected by the central chemoreceptors. And here we have the responses, okay, to hypoventilation and hyperventilation. If we have a hypoventilation, there's gonna be an, an increase in the CO2 that will lower the pH of the blood, there's going to be low oxygen. Chemoreceptors are going to respond by increasing ventilation, which makes a negative feedback on or changes. The, the, the CO2 is going to go down, the oxygen is going to go up, the pH is going to be established. Okay, it's the typical uh, feedback loop of all the homeostatic processes. Remember, if you learn very well these feedback loops, you simply have to change the names and the processes there. Okay, this can be used for the CO2 pH 
for the oxygen, can be used for glucose, can be used for all the things. Okay, so at the end when you know these mechanisms, how they work, remember I told you physiology becomes boring because it's the same with the same with the same with the same. Okay, just change the name, change the organ. Now, besides the chemo chemoreceptors, we have receptors in the lungs, for example, stretch receptors. Yeah, we already mentioned something about this, the heading drewer reflex. Don't try to inflate your lungs too much. There is a limit. Okay, we can go beyond certain uh, level. Okay, when we stretch the lungs, the pleura, the tissue of the lung too much, okay, that is gonna uh, activate the heading brewer reflex or inflation reflex, and that's gonna stop inspiration. It's protecting the lungs. Uh, well, we also have some uh, intervention, or when we uh, deflate the lungs too much, there is another a reflex that is called the deflation reflex. If you try to empty your lungs too much, there is a moment when you have to stop. Not only because of the deflation reflex, also because there is no way that you can compress the ribs and the cartilage and all the solid structures of the chest wall. The virus nerve, okay, it sends also inhibitory signals to a nucleus that is called the nucleus ambiguous, that is in the reticular formation. The reticular formation you haven't probably studied this, about this too much. This is the brain stem, this is the brain here, cerebellum, this is the pons, this is the medulla, or this is the brain stem. There are many nuclei in the brain, in, in the medulla, in the pons, in the midbrain. All of these nuclei together form what we call the reticular formation, also known as reticular activating system, which is the group of neurons that makes us or keeps us awake, alert, and oriented. Okay, we can be sleeping very peacefully, and maybe we have the alarm for 6 a.m., but maybe at 5 a.m., there is a noise, okay, and through the auditory nerve, one of these nuclei is gonna be activated and that's gonna send signals to the brain cortex, wake up. Okay, there have been, uh, I think you, you can see documentaries or experiments. For example, it's the, a, a woman that just gave birth, okay, after three days of delivery or, or uh, 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 trying to give birth. She's very tired, she's very sleepy. She's in the hospital, there's a lot of noise, people walking, many places, a lot of noise, light, she's sleeping, and the baby just says, <coughs> and she wakes up. Okay, so that reticular activating system filters the stimuli, okay, telling the person what is important, what is not, okay, in, in every moment. So this virus nerve, okay, uh, inhibits the nucleus ambiguous, okay, and that will result in inhibition of the parasympathetic output to the sinoatrial node. So if we decrease the parasympathetic stimulus, that is going to lead to an increase in the heart rate during inspiration. Okay, those are little reflexes that occur okay, during the cardiac cycle, com a combination of the actions of the respiratory centers and the centers for parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. Also, there are irritant receptors. Okay, every time we inhale something that is irritant, the name says. Okay, if you have smoked at any moment, remember the first time you, the first cigarette, how irritant it was. Okay, people normally start coughing, coughing, coughing. Or anytime we breathe something that is uh, noxious or contains irritants, smoke, dust, anything that will stimulate the cough reflex. Okay, that uh, besides producing cough, uh, will lead to an increase in the respiratory rate, will produce bronchoconstriction, okay, and may produce sneezing too. Okay, and that is what is expected. If the lungs perceive that the environment is poisonous, okay, the bronchi are not going to open up to get more of that poison. Okay, that will produce bronchoconstriction, trying to reduce the amount of air with that irritant that enters the lungs. And here we have all the receptors, juxta capillary, or J receptors. Okay, uh, these are receptors that are in the interstitial space within the alveolar walls, and they will, when they are, they are stimulated, they will produce dyspnea. 
Okay, this map, um, it's important to have clear when you study what are the differences between signs and symptoms. Okay, symptoms are subjective feelings that the patients tell you but you cannot measure or observe. Okay, when you see a patient that has asthma, okay, the patient, you see that they have an increased work of breathing. They have an increased respiratory effort. Respiratory rate is increased, depth is increased. They may have use of accessory muscles. They may have a retractions of the intercostal spaces. Those are signs. But shortness of breath is not a symptom. It's something the patients tell you. Dyspnea is a symptom. It's the subjective feeling of having shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Okay, that can occur when people have asthma or when people are anxious or when people are afraid or when people have a real problem in the lungs or simply because of psychological reasons. Okay? So this uh, stimulation of these gel receptors will produce the sensation of shortness of breath. Okay? And we may see it outside as a rapid shallow breathing, we may see it as an increase the work of breathing. Notice that the stimulation occurs when there is expansion of the interstitial space because of water present there. Okay, every time water increases in the interstitial space of the lungs, that will produce dyspnea. So it can be sometimes the first manifestation of heart failure. Okay, just having dyspnea. Some people, when they have, for example, a problems in the circulation in the heart, coronary artery obstruction, and they have ischemia of the heart, the first thing that they feel is pain, okay, chest pain. It's a normal thing that appears in response to ischemia of the heart. Now, some people don't have pain when they have a ischemia or a myocardial infarction, because for example, they have diabetes, and diabetes in the long term destroys the nerves. So they may have a silent myocardial infarction. Okay, so when they have any cardiac problem, the heart is not contracting very well, all the fluid that should be circulating from the lungs to the heart and to the rest of the body stays in the lungs. Okay, we have an increase in the fluid in the lung that will start producing accumulation of water in the interstitial space, producing dyspnea. So dyspnea can be the first manifestation of heart failure or myocardial infarction or simply ischemia in the heart. Okay, they not necessarily need to have chest pain. And I tell you this because someone called me the other day. Well, I went to Leon Medical Center and they told me I had to get the, the, the vaccine for the pneumonia. And I told them, but do you think uh, it's, uh, today is a good day for that because I feel like I have some shortness of breath. And they told her, no, no, if you have shortness of breath, no. Uh, come another day. What was the shortness of breath? Nervous. What about the shortness of breath? Yeah. Why? <laughs> and she was having shortness of breath for a week. And I told her, no, you have to go, forget about the vaccine. You have to go there and say, good afternoon. I have shortness of breath for a week. <laughs> because if you talk about the vaccine, then the shortness of breath gets diluted. And, and, okay. Because that can be the manifestation of something really bad going on there. And this is a woman, she is like 80 something. No, because maybe it's asthma. Have you ever had asthma? Yeah, when I was a kid. Okay. Are you still a kid? <laughs> going back to that age. Huh? That is probably a heart failure that she's start, starting to have. Okay. So, well, the vagus nerve is the one that carries most of these impulses, okay? There you have some connections that have to do with the neural control of the respiration. Okay, you have uh, the, the sensors for CO2 and oxygen from the carotid, so sorry, for the aortic arc, okay, carrying, okay, information, okay, CO2 oxygen levels. They remember from the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, we, we carry also pH. Okay, all these are gonna stimulate 
the respiratory centers, and then we are going to have the efferent signals to the uh, respiratory muscles. What is the nerve that carries motor signals to the diaphragm? Phrenic nerve. Do you remember where it arises in the? C3 and C4. Very well. And what about the intercostals? Sorry, I didn't Intercostal muscles. What nerves are the ones that? Intercostal muscles are innervated by the? That is an easy, an easy one. Okay. Remember the these are the vertebrae, are the ribs. Okay, everything in between the ribs will receive its own spinal nerve, depending on the level, because it's like but everything that starts above the, the the rib portion, above the thoracic portion. There are no ribs in the neck. So all these nerves are gonna move more freely. Okay. And you study the derm have you already studied the dermatomes and so? Next week. Yes. Next week. Oh, wait. <laughs> 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 The best way of studying the dermatomes is drawing this. My, this is an embryo. This is an embryo. Okay? The dermatomes in the embryo are like this. Okay, so every nerve it will innervate its own area. But then when these arms and legs start growing, okay, all this gets mixed up because the leg is like twisting. In the embryonic fetal development, the legs and the arms like twist. That's why you have all these dermatomes twisted around the arm and the leg. Okay? But the dermatomes in the center, in the trunk, they are straight. Okay? Okay, T4, T5, T6, T7. Okay? Until about T10, T11, more or less. But at the end of this presentation, there are some questions. Okay, that you can use. When you study these questions, uh, I'm not sure if here you have the answers highlighted, but try to study them like this. In some PowerPoints, there are like animations that show you underline the, the correct answer later. Okay, don't go directly to the answer. Try to make a small effort. Okay, that effort is the one that pays off, even if you don't know. Okay, you have a 19-year-old male okay, that undergoes an exercise toy test, so he's going to exercise like crazy, okay, trying to measure the maximal oxygen uptake during exercise. Which of the following changes are most likely to occur during exercise? That's the question. The, the, the upper part is not important at all. If you read only the which of the following, you notice that the history about the guy, and that is not important at all. Okay, when you see a long question, start reading from here. And you determine if you need to read the other thing or not. So what happens during exercise? Do we have an increase in vascular resistance? Do we have constriction in the blood vessels of the lung? No. no. Do we have a decrease in the physiologic dead space? No. Yes. Ah. Decreased alveolar arterial, but there are concepts that I know you haven't studied. Okay, um, decreased alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. Gradient is difference. Okay, difference in the oxygen that we have in the alveoli and the arterial blood during exercise that will be very different. No. Remember, the only thing that changes a lot during exercise is the venous blood that contains a lot of CO2 and is very acidic. Once the blood passes through the lungs, it's like if we are not exercising. It gets immediately 100% oxygen and gets rid of all the, the, the CO2 and everything. So there is not gonna be any important difference between the alveolar oxygen and the arterial oxygen. Okay, we are gonna see that difference when, for example, there is edema because now the oxygen has difficulty moving through. Okay, that's for the future. Increase partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries. 
it's gonna be the same. Okay, remember the arterial part is almost like when we are not exercising. Increasing the apical ventilation to perfusion ratio. That means we are gonna have more ventilation than blood in the apices. No, the contrary, we are gonna have more blood. Remember, we are recruiting the blood vessels in the apices. You're not gonna have this question in the exam. Not even a similar. Okay, what you're gonna study from here is the concepts. What concept we have here in exercise, we have a reduction in the physiological dead space. That's it. Or we recruit blood vessels, okay, that weren't in use during or before the exercise. Okay, we have more perfusion of the lungs. This is very long when you have a, a, a long question. Remember, start uh, reading in the which. Which of the following findings would you uh, most likely? No, that, that's, that's part of the story. We're not gonna enter into that because it's not necessary now. That's part of the story too. Mm. But this Try to break down this question. Which of the following best explain the results in the pulmonary function test? So it, it, sometimes you need to read the question, like in this case. <laughs> so you have a 65-year-old man with hypertension, diabetes, and comes because of a history of shortness of breath for two days. Everything that is written in the multiple choice question, when it's well written, is important. The age, the sex. Because if we tell you, uh, I don't know, uh, hyaline membrane of the newborn, that is not likely, no? Or pregnancy, that's not likely in this case. Now, the most important thing here is the two-day history. You know that you are gonna not choose any chronic disease. Oh, lung cancer. Hmm. Nobody develops the symptoms of a lung cancer in two days. That's, well, you can, but not in a multiple choice question. And this, right, two days is to tell you this is something acute. Happened yesterday or the day before. Okay, it's not going on for a while. Or they tell you a previously healthy, telling you forget about chronic diseases. Okay, temperature, 36.9. Is there a pneumonia? No. No. In real life there could be, and not, this guy doesn't have any money because the temperature is normal, okay? Pulse is 100, respiration steady. That is a problem there. It's breathing too fast. And the blood pressure, just so. Well, this type of person, we would say normal. And I, you know, when someone is in, in distress, they should have a, a, even higher blood pressure. Okay, because of the distress, so that's perfectly normal. Now, pulmonary function tests show decreased tidal volume and normal lung compliance. The tidal volume, remember, is, is this 500 ml. The lung compliance is how much the lungs expand for a given pressure. Okay, I apply, apply a pressure of one unit, the lungs expand one unit. If I have to apply a pressure of two or three units to get the one unit expansion, that is a low compliance, that is stiff. So the expansibility of the lungs is normal. The only thing that is decreased is the tidal volume. Instead of 500, it's maybe 300. That's why the guy has to breathe fast, to get the same oxygen in the blood than before. What can be there? Pulmonary. Emphysema, don't rush. Don't rush. No, because those are part of the chronic diseases, emphysema and the diabetes. Do you have there many chronic diseases? Emphysema. Who can tell me two? Diabetes. What three acute things there? B, D, B. B, what is it? B, D, and E. B, D, and E. Well, this is acute too, but. Yeah. But I don't. 
But it's Have you ever seen someone with diabetic ketoacidosis? Yes. Yeah. How yes. they breathe? Fast. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 the smell. How, how fast or deep they breathe. If we have, when we have acidosis, we are producing yeah. too much hydrogen that is converted to CO2, so we need to eliminate that CO2. <laughs> it's going to be a very fast and deep respiration. So no, it's not a decrease in diet alcohol. No, this guy is breathing as deep. This is this guy. Is that Cosmo? Huh? Cosmo. Cosmo. Cosmo is the one for... Is it a rift? This is respiratory, uh, in, in respiratory, uh, in metabolic acidosis, to get rid of the CO2. That's Cosmo. That is Cosmo. This is shallow and fast. We said this could be a tension pneumothorax, a rib fracture, or a pulmonary edema. Is there anything in the question that tells you that this guy has a tension pneumothorax? But in normal compliance. Can so someone has a tension pneumothorax is when you have a lung collapse, and every time you breathe in, there is more air in that lung that pushes the other lung to the other side. Can someone be two days with that? No. That is an emergency. It's a surgical emergency. So these three are not. Rib fracture, pulmonary edema. There's if someone has pulmonary edema, compare two sets of lungs, normal lungs and lungs with pulmonary edema, which is heavier. Pulmonary edema. Because it has what? Pulmonary. And it's very heavy. What happens when you try to expand lungs that contain lots of water? Is it easy? No. How's going to be the compliance? Decrease compliance. So the decrease compliance is what is going to rule out the pulmonary edema. Lungs with water are heavy, they are very difficult to expand, so they are stiff. Okay, the only thing that can make you breathe very shallowly and fast is a refraction because of the pain. Exactly. Yeah, but there's no, there's no yeah. description. Yeah, they jump right No, but you have things that tell you it is not pulmonary edema, it is not diabetic ketoacidosis because it would be fast and deep. I met in the urgent care, I saw a case, of an, in the urgent care I saw a case of an older lady that she just started like feeling pain like here in the chest and it was kind of like hard to breathe. She didn't fall, no trauma. She said that it started up she went to reach out for something, for fashion. But she has to have something, like osteoporosis or... Exactly, but um, like there was no trauma like that. Yeah. Well, the same thing here. This is a question that is pure pathophysiology. <laughs> so you are not studying diseases. What you are studying is volumes and capacities of the lungs. What is compliance, what is uh, tidal volume, what is inspiratory reserve volume, yeah. and so on. Okay, and there you have more, okay, but again, study the concepts there. <laughs> and this other presentation is something that I was creating, trying to do some animations, how the air enters in and out, and your diaphragm goes down. And then the ribs expand, you have more oh, air, right? then you stop, okay, the compression of the chest, the recoil, takes the air out, and then mm. relaxation of the diaphragm, see, how interesting. <laughs> Did you do that? You made yeah. that? So oh, tell us. <laughs> and this is simply explaining what happens, how or why the lungs inflate, because of the difference in pressure between the, the intrapleural pressure and alveolar pressure, which is the transpulmonary pressure. Okay. Uh, and how they deflate, simply because of variations in pressure. This diagram is more to explain how what happens when there is a pneumothorax. Okay. And there is a remember the Intrapleural pressure is kept negative because of this 
the lungs are like a spring that is pulling towards the center, okay, and the chest wall, okay, is like pulling outwards. So there is a negative pressure in the pleural cavity of around minus five millimeters of water, okay, but if we open, there is a trauma to the chest wall, okay, now the pressure in the pleural space is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. So now we don't have any transpulmonary pressure uh, difference, and that will lead to the, the tissue of the lung, the elastic tissue of the lung, okay, will be, a, will be free, okay, to collapse, okay, when it overcomes this transpulmonary pressure. And these are more things that I'm developing okay, for the future. There you have the, the relationship between the alveolar pressure and the, the air, no? the, 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 the volume of air. When you have a negative alveolar pressure, negative uh, uh, relative to the atmospheric pressure, air goes in. So you have the blood, the breath volume going up, up to 0 0.5 liters, the tidal volume. Okay, and then when you have the increase in alveolar pressure, then you start having the air out, expiration. That's the tidal volume. It's the same concept explained in a different way. Let's have a break now. Okay, it's 2.06. Let's have a 10-minute break. Okay. <laughs> again for a couple of positions in PATO. Um, it's going to be SGA, internal affairs, external, external affairs, and then historian. So if anybody's interested in... Otherwise we're going to recruit you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's important. It's very important for everyone. We will help you guys. Everybody. Help so, us help you. What, are we going to vote today? Yes. So at, to, at the end of class, we are all gonna whoever want, is interested in becoming part of the group and raise your hand and we'll all vote. <laughs> Any questions? Can we come right here? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that we can. Oh, <laughs> There is a new motor. Yeah. 
diseases that are associated with them. Mm. Okay, musculoskeletal, imagine, from the, all the bones in the head, all the trauma, all the uh, soft tissue, all the muscle problems, all the rheumatologic conditions, okay, all the problems that can be associated to musculoskeletal uh, diseases in kids or in the elderly or in different ages. And what about the gastrointestinal? You start in the salivary glands and the mouth, 
can get the padding, the swallowing mechanism, the esophagus, can get the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, colon, hemorrhoids, all the problems in the anus of that area, then the liver with the infections, hepatitis, the gallbladder with the gallstones, and the cancers in every part and all the organs there, and then the bile and the interpretation of the liver function tests and the hepatitis panels, all that is a lot of information. And only studying diarrhea can take you a lot of time. Understanding okay, the, the different types of diarrhea, what can produce them, the different types of infections, viral, bacterial, parasitic infections. So it can be forever studying only one thing. Even the, when you go to the different specialties, you're going to find someone who is a gastroenterologist, but then you have people who are specialized in the liver only, the hepatologist, okay? And they, they refer patients to each other, okay? A gastroenterologist refers people to the hepatologist because they say, I have, I have no clue, but you have, okay? And they have to study the patient better. So in mind preparing for a board exam, okay, with all these conditions. So we are going to be trying to understand the function of the different things, for example, saliva, salivary glands, okay? Very few people know that saliva has a function. No? It's just this thing that we produce in the mouth to swallow and lubricate the mouth. But there are many, many functions. And when you study how the body produces saliva and the similarity in the production of saliva to the production of sweat, for example, and the production of urine, they have many, many, many similarities. Okay, in every case we are producing a filtrate from the plasma. Either to, to produce urine or sweat or saliva, we filtrate the plasma. Okay, and if we have anything in excess, we are gonna eliminate it through there. Okay, for example, people with kidney failure, and you have someone with a stage, a final stage of chronic kidney disease, that the, their kidneys are not eliminating waste, they start eliminating waste through the sweat. And you can see, for example, when they are in the hospital, that there is a very low temperature and the sweat dries on the skin. You can see like a frost. And they smell like urine because they are eliminating ammonia and urea through the sweat glands. And we're gonna be starting all these processes that occur in the mouth, swallowing mostly, not the chewing, but the swallowing process. Chewing is more for dentists. Okay, and you ask any, any physician, how much you know about the teeth, about the mouth? The same thing that I know about the eyes. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Where is that cage? Hey, that's Um, let me check. No, not yet. So then the main focus of our studies are going to be in the swallowing mechanism and the role of the esophagus, the sphincters, how they participate in the swallowing, and then the different phases of the digestion. Okay, digestion starts or can start simply by us thinking our food. Okay, oh, it's time for dinner. That's, that starts the process. Or someone calls us, I'm here at this cafeteria with a nice uh, coconut ice cream with vanilla and you start like, Hmm. <laughs> what is it again? <laughs> that starts the, the process of digestion in the head. Okay, that activates certain, uh, the motility of the intestines, activates the production of enzymes, mucus, a little bit. Okay, then we are going to be studying what happens in the, in the stomach. Okay, how the stomach uh, regulates the amount of acid that we produce. Okay, and how the stomach uh, performs. A very important function, okay, that is the production of intrinsic factor, which is necessary for the, for the absorption of vitamin B12. The B12 uh, metabolism and handling is a very interesting process that starts in the mouth. Okay, in the saliva we also have, we have a protein that binds to B12, okay, to protect it. Okay, when it gets to the stomach so the acid doesn't destroy it. Okay, then this protein from the saliva leaves B12 into the hands of intrinsic factor that will protect it okay, in the tree. 
okay, in the small intestine until we absorb it, okay, at the end of the small intestine, the ileum, the last part. So we are going to be seeing the different processes, okay, how these different viscerate move, the motility, okay, the digestion, breakdown of food to obtain the nutrients, the absorption of those nutrients, okay, how they are transported after being absorbed. And we are going to be seeing that for the stomach, small intestine, for the large intestine, and also we are going to see how the liver, gallbladder, pancreas cooperate, okay, in that mechanism. Okay, it's a very, very interesting uh, study when you put all that together. And when, if you have studied biology before, okay, you can compare the digestive system in different animals and the digestive system of humans. Okay, and there are, I don't remember the name of that animal that is only like a, like a, like a worm that is only a stomach, like moving. How, how's the name of that? What is that tiny? Caterpillar? Mm -hmm. The caterpillar? I, I, I would agree. That's a weird name. It's just a stomach. It's just a stomach. It's a worm. It's a worm, but yeah. it's just a stomach. It has no nervous system, nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's like a not of with a stomach. It's a moving stomach. Oh, I guess I remember that from my house. Hamlet? 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 Helmet? It's a sponge? No. It moves. It moves. But sponges are moving. They are moving. Oh, wait, that's a stomach. Is it like a parasite? I don't know. 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 So, it wasn't a tapeworm? Yeah. It's tiny. Okay. So, here we have the, yeah. the way. Most of them are shit here, so I'm not sure what's this. Okay, the gastrointestinal digestive system in physiology. What is that? It's like a series of compartments. In okay, mind you have to design the factory and you have to it's connected create several departments that they communicate with each other. Okay, we have, a, we start from left to right, okay, we have the mouth, okay, where we produce saliva in order to start the chewing of the food, start the digestion of, for example, carbohydrates. There is an enzyme, amylase, that breaks down most of the starch that is present there. Yeah. Okay, it's an enzyme that is also produced in the pancreas, it's very similar. Okay, we have the grinding, mixing, swallowing of the food. Okay, then the food has to move yes. into the pharynx. We're going to be seeing the, the swallowing mechanism there. There are muscles, okay, that are called constrictor muscles of the pharynx that will push, okay, the food downwards, okay, to the esophagus. Okay, with S, these uh, parts that have an S are the different sphincters, which are bands or circular bands of a smooth muscle that will keep the compartments separate from each other. And they are going to control very well what moves between one compartment and the other and try to guarantee that the foot always moves in that direction, okay? Not backwards. Sometimes we need to move it backwards. Okay, for example, to activate the vomiting mechanism. Okay, when we consider, the body considers that there is something dangerous, okay, in that uh, food, we're going to try to eliminate that. So in the esophagus, we are going to have peristaltism, peristaltic waves that are going to move the food towards the stomach. Notice that to pass the food through the esophagus, you need to overcome one and two sphincters. What is called the upper esophageal sphincter, just in the a junction between the pharynx and the esophagus. And then we have the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, from there the food is going to enter into that stomach. Okay, that the cells there produce acid, producing intrinsic factor. Okay, which is, is, is something that is not producing anywhere else in the body, it's only in the stomach. Okay, the stomach may serve as a reservoir for food. We may have 
in some cases up to one liter of food in the stomach for some hours, depending on how much we eat and what type of food. Okay, and notice there is another sphincter here, okay, between the stomach and the small intestine. And it's called the pyloric sphincter. Okay, and that works controlling the amount of food that enters from the stomach into the small intestine. Okay, now with that food, we call it chyme, okay, after it's mixed with the acid. Okay, and it's gonna be releasing little by little. Let's say the pyloric sphincter opens and it just lets a little bit of chyme to move into the duodenum and then closes. In the duodenum, the chyme is gonna be mixed with the bicarbonate in the pancreas, and from the pancreatic enzymes, amylase, lipase, colipase, other enzymes, with the bile, and will facilitate the digestion of the fats. Once everything is ready, and the small intestine takes that uh, chyme away from the duodenum, and the duodenum is empty, now we open again the pyloric sphincter, and start the process with another very little amount of chyme. Going to have to okay, then this once we move all the contents of the stomach into that small intestine, uh, okay, that's gonna stay there for a while. He is currently using like, pound points, so the intestine is gonna be like so. turning it around, okay, different, the peristaltic movements uh, are different, the uh, types of uh, contractions that we are gonna be seeing. Okay, and when we consider we have absorbed all the nutrients from that food, okay, then we are gonna produce low peristaltic waves. Okay, to take the rest of the food from there. One that we consider doesn't have any more nutrients towards the colon. Okay, for that we need to open this sphincter here, that is the idiosical valve. Okay, then we have all that content in the colon. The function of the colon is to keep it there for a while and reabsorb as much water as possible. And maybe some vitamins that could be present there. Okay, and then the rest. Okay, after we dehydrate all that material, it's gonna be moved, okay, towards the sigmoid rectum. And when the rectum is full, that is gonna create a reflex that we call the uh, defecation reflex. And for this reflex, we have the participation of two sphincters, the internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, okay, but it is surrounded by skeletal muscle, okay, that we call the external sphincter. But typically when the rectum is full, the internal sphincter will open and will tell us, okay, this is full, you need to evacuate. All right. What comes next depends on where we are. If we're in a convenient place, okay. If we are not, we voluntarily close the external sphincter and that will pass. No, that will Professor, yeah. I hope that the closure controls are functioning well. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Uh, no, uh, when we, we are recording offline, it is. So after. Like in 20 minutes. <laughs> All that noise I made, I like wake up at the same time. I don't know, I thought there's no one with it. No, I like what? So, we are going to be seeing some basic concepts as in every other system. Okay, what is digestion? Digestion simply means the breakdown of food, large particles, polymers, okay, into monomers, which are the structural units of those molecules. For example, a polymer, very common polymer that we eat is starch, okay, that is present in many carbohydrates. Starch is a huge molecule that is made of many or thousands and thousands of molecules of glucose. Okay, so we need to break down that starch until we obtain the glucose. Okay, then, for example, from the proteins, we obtain amino acids. From the fats, we obtain uh, the monoglycerides, glycerol, Okay, different monomers. Then we have absorption, and absorption, we typically absorb only the monomers. We don't absorb, uh, for example, the large proteins or starch. Okay, only babies, only newborns, are able to absorb proteins, entire proteins. And that's very important for them because they need to 
get this protein from the mother uh, uh, during breastfeeding. They need to absorb amino uh, uh, antibodies, okay, and some maternal proteins that are present in the milk that will enter directly into a big protein into the circulation of the baby. And that's why there is so much debate about when should we introduce other foods. Because if the babies are absorbing entire proteins, okay, it's not a big deal if they absorb maternal milk protein. But if they absorb cow milk protein, and they are not ready for that, they may develop allergies. And so that's why there is so much debate about when should we introduce this or that. So absorption is anything that goes from the lumen into the blood, and secretion is the contrary, okay? The things that we uh, produce, that our cells produce, and are secreted into the lumen. For example, digestive enzymes, mucus, uh, different things that we secrete into the lumen of the intestine. And we are going to be talking about regulation, okay, that can't uh, be missing in any physiology lecture, okay? And we are going to be talking about the third part of the autonomic nervous system, which is the enteric nervous system. Okay, we studied the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, we are going to be talking about the enteric nervous system, which is another branch of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, for some physiologists, it's a different nervous system. They, they don't want to mix it up with the autonomic. Doesn't matter how you study it, being part or not of the autonomic nervous system, is, the result is going to be the same. Okay, then we have a diagram that shows how many different things participate in regulating the gastrointestinal function. Okay, we have reflexes, as in every other process in the body. Some reflexes are local reflexes that we manage at the local level, and some of them need the participation of the nervous system, endocrine system. Okay, for example, uh, if you start here from the left, we have sensory neurons in the, in the intestines, in the stomach, okay, that are sensing the composition of the food. If there are amino acids, if there, are, if there is glucose, if there are fatty acids, okay, the different things that are present there. And that sensory neuron is going to send information to integrating neurons that are going to send signals to the effector neuron. All of this is going to happen or is going to be regulated uh, in the enteric nervous system. So that is a local regulation. There are some neurotransmitters and neuromodulators that are produced for these uh, reflexes, these connections here. For example, serotonin, vasoactive intestinal peptide, nitric oxide, and they produce the local regulation. Okay, this enteric nervous system Okay, is also influenced by, for example, the gut microbiota, the different bacteria that we have, different populations of bacteria, and also the endocrine system is going to act on these uh, neurons that can lead to an increase or, or a decrease in the secretion, motility, uh, absorption, any activity of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And of course, the uh, Autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, will have a role, okay? When we are in basal conditions, it's not necessarily the intervention of the autonomic nervous system, but when we are under stress, we need the sympathetic nervous system to stop, okay, the digestion and dedicate the blood, dedicate the energy of the body to all those stuff. Okay, normally, most of our functions are under what we call a parasympathetic tone. For example, the heart. If you leave a heart alone, without any intervention, the heart rate is gonna be around 100 per minute. But the autonomic, the parasympathetic influence slows it down, okay? Normally, most of the day, okay, we are under a parasympathetic tone also on the intestines, okay? If you count, when you have breakfast, when you have lunch, when you eat a snack, when you have dinner, we spend many hours during the day doing digestion. Okay, we are supposed to have the parasympathetic nervous system controlling that that digestion occurs properly. Okay, now the most important thing is the local regulation because in every organ we will have a different process happening. 
okay, before we eat, okay, just after we eat, or when all the food passes to the small intestine, or when we have the food in the large intestine. Okay, the local regulation is gonna be the most important thing, but always we have the supervision of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So we have this chart for local reflexes, integrated in the enteric nervous system, composed by these two plexa, the submucosal plexus that typically controls the secretions and the myenteric plexus that controls the motility of the different viscerae. And the lung reflexes are those okay, that uh, integrate uh, these functions in the central nervous system. Okay, these are reflexes that we call cephalic reflexes. And there are many factors that participate. Remember the feed forward regulation okay, for the production of different enzymes or uh, hormones in the case of insulin. There are some emotional components. Okay, that's why you're gonna, probably you know people that say, I am upset, I'm not gonna eat right now. Because if I eat, I know I'm gonna have a bad problem with the digestion. Some people don't care, they can be upset and arguing and eating at the same time. <laughs> and the autonomic nervous system, typically the parasympathetic is excitatory or stimulates digestive function and the sympathetic is inhibitory or stops the digestive function. So we are gonna take a look at what happens during the different phases of digestion, okay? And this is typically divided in three phases, cephalic, gastric, and intestinal. And to understand this, simply try to imagine what happens in your body, okay? One of the advantages that we have when we study medicine is that we are studying ourselves, okay? We are not studying an elephant. That you, you learn about the physical exam of the elephant and you have to ask for permission at the zoo to practice. No, you can practice with yourself during the night. You can auscultate yourself, you can palpate your abdomen, your lymph nodes, no? That's the best way of learning. Same thing for this, try to mind what happens in your back. Okay, before you eat, when you are about to eat, the cephalic phase. Okay, uh, we simply are thinking our food or smelling, someone is cooking a barbecue, our neighbor, so we say, oh my goodness, that smells really good. <laughs> Saliva starts to be uh, being produced. Okay, we start feeling some sensation of hunger. Okay, motility, some motility in the stomach. Okay, it's mediated by taste, smell, receptors, or sight, or, or touch, simply. And we're gonna start producing some saliva, also some gastric secretions. Acid is produced, okay, some pancreatic secretion as well. Okay, we start having some motility. Notice that there is an increase in the blood flow okay, in the upper part of the intestines, celiac artery. Okay, the blood that goes to the stomach, Okay, the blood that goes to the liver, the blood that goes to the proximal parts of the small intestine. Now, the gastric phase begins when we start distending the stomach. Okay? Normally, when the stomach is empty during the cephalic phase, the pH in the stomach should be around 1 or 2. Very, very, very acidic. Okay? Once the food gets into the stomach, now the food buffers the acid of the, st of the stomach, so the pH of the stomach goes up, maybe to four or five. Okay, so we have the distension of the stomach and the increase in the pH. There are some mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors that detect these changes, okay? And after we ingest the food, okay, that phase is gonna end maybe 15, 30 minutes after uh, we ingest uh, that food. Okay, at the same time, we're going to start moving some of these kind into the duodenum. All of these things happen. Uh, it's not that we finish one phase and then start the other. There is like an overlap between these phases. Notice that here, uh, we also have an increase in the blood flow through the celiac artery, exactly as before. Then we have the intestinal phase that starts when the uh, 
the chyme, the gastric chyme enters into the duodenum and starts distending the duodenum and changing the pH of the duodenum. The duodenum normally has a, a neutral pH of around 7. Now we have this chyme that has a pH of 4 or 5 getting there, and it's a different pH. So we have also chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors okay, that will feel that, uh, those changes. This phase lasts longer, notice, from two to six hours, because it depends on what we are eating. If you simply have a glass of milk or an orange juice, that's going to last for 10 minutes, and you're going to say, what else? I'm hungry again. But if we eat something that has lots of fat, protein, that uh, intestinal phase may be extended, extended for very long. And now notice that there is a change in the blood flow. Now instead of celiac artery that goes to stomach, liver, now we have the superior mesenteric artery. It's the one that is, has the greatest blood flow now. And you can see more details okay, about these phases okay, by looking at these different diagrams. Okay, what happens, for example, in the cephalic phase. You have two diagrams that represent different things. That's why I put the, the two of them. It's very hard to find one that has all the information. Maybe it would be impossible to understand, no? So here we have the cephalic phase, receptors for smell, sight, taste, touch, okay, stimulate brain cortex, hypothalamus, signals travel down the, the brainstem, and we're going to have the signals going through the vagus nerve, parasympathetic impulses that will stimulate all the enteric nervous system okay, at, the, at different levels. For example, in the gastric phase, we are going to have that it's in, initiated by stretch receptor stimulation and chemoreceptors that detect the change in pH and stretch. What is going to happen as a result of this? There is an increase in the gastric juice production. Okay, and we start having the, an increase in motility, increased gastric peristalsis, okay, that will start like uh, grinding the food, they are mixing the food with the acid, etc. Okay, and then we start having the, uh, we start having the gastric emptying, so part of the chyme moves into the duodenum, starting the intestinal phase. So you have the receptors, stretch and chemoreceptors, okay, that will uh, initiate the intestinal phase. Now, understanding this is not only this part, okay, it's not that simple. We also have to study, okay, some of the hormones and some of the paracrine substances that we produce during those different phases. And also the digestive enzymes that we produce Okay, what is the, their function? Why, when the food enters into the duodenum, okay, we start having uh, certain changes in the pancreas and in the motility of the stomach that weren't occurring before. Okay, what are, what are the hormones and paracrines that determine that we increase or decrease the production of acid, okay, depending on uh, the different phases of digestion that we are in. Okay, and this is what we are going to be studying uh, the next week. Okay, you have there, if you want to start studying this, because you have nothing else to study, right? <laughs> but if you want to start studying this, you have there uh, something, okay, in advanced. Notice that, for example, when the food enters into the stomach, the stomach produces a chemical that is called gastrin, Okay, and uh, notice what interesting thing. Gastrin is going to be secreted into the blood from, from the stomach. Notice that gastrin goes to the blood and then it comes back to the stomach. Why don't you stay there? Okay, it's like if I have to tell something a student and I go out go to the first floor, come up and then come back and tell something to that student. It's something that is hard to understand. So that thing is a heart. Okay, it goes to the blood and then comes back to stimulate the production of acid. I don't know, if someone has a, a, a answer for that, I, I would like to know. 
it returns to the stomach to stimulate contraction of the stomach and also the acid production. What, what is gastrin doing in the blood and then back? Then we have increase in acid production, we have increase in motility of the stomach. We start partially digesting the food, we call it chyme now. The chyme enters the small intestine, and when it enters there, the small intestine is gonna produce a couple of hormones, cholecystokinin and secretin. And here you're gonna use medical terminology. Cholecysto, what is the meaning of chole? Has to do with the gallbladder, okay? Cholecysto is gallbladder, kinin. So that cholecystokinin, CCK, is the one that is gonna make the gallbladder contract. Okay? And secretin, okay, is gonna stimulate the pancreas to produce pancreatic, what? Pancreatic lipase only? Well, we are going to leave it as a general uh, knowledge today. Both cholecystokinin and secretin, both, are going to stimulate the pancreas, okay, to produce digestive enzymes and bicarbonate that are going to uh, be incorporated into the duodenum. Because remember, that kind that comes from the stomach has a very acidic pH, four or five. So we need to add bicarbonate to neutralize that. Because if we don't neutralize it, the pancreatic enzymes can't work. Pancreatic enzymes, amylase, lipase, etc., they only work if there is a pH of 7. So we need that bicarbonate to make possible that the pancreatic enzymes work. Okay, and also because of the contraction of the gallbladder, we are going to have the bile that is necessary for the digestion of the fat. And we are going to stop it there. The cholecystokinin and secretin is a bit more complex but that's going to be for next week. Okay, so let's leave it there as a general concept.